There we go. Hello, I'm Alice Hutchinson, the owner of Birds Books, an independent bookstore in Bethel, Connecticut, and I am honored to be the host of Write America. The aim of this series is to help set the country back on a correct, productive course of freedom, justice, equality, and plain human kindness. Write America is a literary series created by author Roger Rosenblatt, featuring award-winning, nationally renowned authors and new and emerging writers in readings and conversations each week about how books and art might bridge the deep divisions in our nation. Write America celebrates the quiet power of art in our lives, the unifying power of the highest uses of language. In novels, stories, essays, and poems, we recognize one another as parts of the human family, one family. Roger Rosenblatt, the creator of Write America, puts it this way, writing makes justice desirable, evil intelligible, grief endurable, and love possible. So with that, I welcome you. And please join us Monday evenings at this time as many of the most beloved and distinguished writers in the country read from their works and talk to each other and with you in an effort to bring us together. If you missed last week's episode with Linda Paston and Miranda Beeson, you can go to Bird's Book's Write America page and link to the episode easily. I have left it in the chat. The link. <laughs> As most of you know, Write America will wrap up its two-year run at the end of January 2023, and the recordings will reside on our YouTube channel for you to watch at any time. Please note, there are three episodes in January that are on Tuesday night, so you'll get all of those details as soon as we finalize the schedule. Tonight's episode is also being recorded, so if you miss something, you can go back and rewatch. The link is right on the front page of our website. Tonight, we're hosting readings by and conversation with Frank Bedart and Richard Tillinghast. I will return at the end and the, after the readings and discussion to bring your questions and comments to the authors. During the episode, please feel free to make comments or ask questions in the chat. We do ask that you remain muted, however. Our first speaker is Frank Bedard. Frank Bedard is the author of many collections of poetry, including Metaphysical Dog, Watching the Spring Festival, Stardust, Desire, and In the Western Night Collected Poems, 1965 to 1990. He has won many prizes, including the Wallace Stevens Award, the Bollingen, Bollingen Prize for Poetry and the National Book, Book Critics Circle Award. His book, Half Light, Collected Poems, 1965 to 2016, won the 2018 Pulitzer Prize and the 2017 National Book Award. His latest publication is Against Silence, Poem, Against Silence Poems, which just went to paperback this month. He lives in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Please welcome to the screen, Frank Bedard. Let me get you there, Frank. Whoops. Can you hear me now? Now I can't hear you. Alice, I can't hear you. Yes, I can hear you and you sound great. Okay. Thanks. It's your turn to read. There you go. Okay, it's my turn to read. All right. Yes, sir. Um, um, Thank you for mentioning my that that uh, again silence came out in paperback. Um, um, the cover is by is a wonderful uh, collage by Joe Brainerd, um, whose work I'm crazy about. Um, and in fact, my reading tonight is is going to be the all the poems I've written about Joe uh, uh, with others. Um, there's a new book that triggered my, that decision. Um, uh, it's called Joe Brainerd, The Art of the Personal. It's by John Yao, Y-A-U. It's by Rizzoli, publisher. And uh, it's a marvelous book. Um, it's, it's fairly expensive. It's like $50, but um, it has enormous number of reproductions. And it's really a wonderful compendium of uh, Joe's work and, 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 and access to Joe's work. And Yao's um, prose is very, very smart and, um, and generous and insightful. Uh, 
So I strongly recommend it. This is the book um, and, and quite wonderful painting by Joe of, of, of a whippet. Um, uh, anyway, I, uh, I've never done this before. That is read all, all the poems I've written about Joe uh, together. Um, and it may be, you know, the the worst aspect of so-called confessional poetry that um, uh, the effect may not be good, but we'll see. Um, uh, uh, I want to start with reading a poem that is about a larger issue that's not that is that is not Joe, uh, but on the other hand, um, uh, it was it was a big issue in his life, and um, uh, it's called Queer. Lie to yourself about this, and you will forever lie about everything. Everybody already knows everything, so you can lie to them. That's what they want. But lie to yourself. What you will lose is yourself. Then you turn into them. For each gay kid whose adolescence was America in the 40s or 50s, the primary, the crucial scenario forever is coming out. Or not, or not, or not, or not, or not. Involuted velleities of self erasure. Quickly after my parents died, I came out. Foundational narrative designed to confer existence. If I had managed to come out to my mother, she would have blamed not me, but herself. The door through which you were shoved out into the light was self-loathing and terror. Thank you, terror. You learned early that adults' genteel fantasies about human life were not, for you, life. You think sex is a knife driven into you to teach you that. Uh, and being gay was a very big issue in, in Joe's life, and he was extremely candid and straightforward about it. And um, so that, that I wanted to begin with that poem. Um, but this is called In Memory of Joe Brainerd. Joe died um, of AIDS in um, 1995. And um, uh, this poem references that. Called In Memory of Joe Brainerd. The remnant of a vast Oceanic bruise, wound delivered early and long ago, was in you purity and sweetness self-gathered, chosen. When I tried to find words for the moral sense that unifies and sweetens the country voices in your collage, the friendly way, you said, it's a code. You were a code I yearned to decipher. In the end, the plague that full swift runs by took you, broke you. In the end, could not take you, did not break you. You had somehow erased within you not only meanness, but anger the desire to punish the universe for everything 
not achieved, not tasted, seen again, touched. The undecipherable code, unbroken, even as the soul learns once again, the body, it loves and hates, is made of verse and will betray it. This is a poem called The Yoke, Y-O-K-E. The Yoke, don't worry, I know you're dead. But tonight, turn your face again toward me. When I hear your voice, there is now no direction in which to turn. I sleep and wake and sleep and wake and sleep and wake and but tonight, turn your face again toward me. See, upon my shoulders is the yoke that is not a yoke. Don't worry, I know you're dead. But tonight, turn your face again. I adore Joe. Uh, I met Joe very late in his life, and I, I had loved his work for many years, and um, I love the voice in his work. Uh, it's a voice of really disarming candor and directness and sweetness. Um, and I'd always wanted to meet him, and somehow never happened until about uh, three years before he died. Um, for the record, we were never lovers, but um, uh, we were more than friends. Um, Another poem. We talked every day on the phone. This is called, If I Could Mourn Like a Morning Dove. It is what recurs that we believe. Your face not at one moment looking sideways up at me, anguished or elate. But the old words, welling up by gravity, rearranged. Two weeks before you died in pain, worn out. After my usual casual sign off with all my love, your simple, solemn, my love to you, Frank. And now a poem written many years after his death. Joe was not candid until a few months before he died about the fact he had AIDS, which was entirely understandable. Uh, it was um, um, uh, people didn't understand what how people got it and uh, and how it was communicated, uh, how it was caught, and so. Um, he was not candid about it, though he said very, very, very quickly after we met, and I felt like a ton of felt like a ton of bricks uh, for him um, that um, he had given up sex. 
And I, I accepted that. I understood that. Um, but anyway, finally, it, um, he was so sick that he had to let people know, which he did. This is called Coat. You who never lied, lied about what you at every moment carried, the shameful, new, incomprehensible disease, which you whose religion was candor couldn't bear not to hide. Now that you've been dead 13 years, I again see you suddenly lay out my coat across your bed, caressing it as if touch could memorize it. No, you're flattening, then smoothing its edges until under your hand as I watch, it becomes hieratic, an icon. What I seized on as promise was valediction. This poem is called For the AIDS Dead. The plague you have thus far survived. They didn't. Nothing that they did in bed that you didn't. Writing a poem I cleave to you. You means I, one, you, as well as the you inside you constantly talk to. Without justice or logic, without sense, you survived. They didn't. Nothing that they did in bed that you didn't. It's obviously a poem about survivor's guilt. And why on earth did some people die and some people catch it and some people didn't? Um, Okay. This is called you you cannot rest. Here the you is not Joe. But oh, one. You cannot rest. The trick was to give yourself only to what could not receive what you had to give. Leaving you as you wished, free. Still you count, you, I'm sorry, still you court the world by enacting yet once more the ecstatic rituals of enthrallment. You cannot rest. The great grounding events in your life wait lodged past change. Like the sweetest, most fantastical myth, enshrining and enslaving promise. The great grounding events, 
that left you so changed you cannot conceive your face without their happening happened when someone could receive just as she once did he did pass judgment of pain or cost could receive did This is called the old man at the wheel. Measured against the immeasurable universe. No word you have spoken brought light. Brought light to what is a child you thought too dark to be survived. By exorcism you survived. By submission. Then making you let, you let all the parts of that thing you would cut out of you enter your poem because enacting there all its parts allowed you to the illusion you could cut it from your soul dilemmas of choice given what cannot change alone roused you to words. As you gripped the things that were young when you were young, they crumble in your hand. Now you must drive west, which in November means driving directly into the sun. This is the next to last poem I'll read called Elegy for Earth. Because Earth's inmates travel in flesh and hide from flesh and adore flesh, you hunger for flesh that does not die. But hunger for the absolute breeds hatred of the absolute those who are the vessels of revelation or who think that they are ravage us with the promise of rescue. My mother outside in the air, waving, shriveled, as if she knew this is the last time, watching as I climbed the stairs and the plane swallowed me. She and I could no more change what we hurtled toward than we could change the weather. Finding my seat unseen, I stared back as she receded. They drop into holes in the earth, everything you loved, loved and hated as you will drop. And the moment when all was possible, gone. You are still above earth. The moment when all and nothing is possible, long gone. Terrified of the sea, we cling to the hull. In, in adolescence, you thought your work ancient work to decipher at last human beings' relation to God. Decipher love, 
to make what was once whole, whole again, or to see why it never should have been thought whole. Earth was a tiny labyrinthine ball orbiting another bigger ball, so bright, you can go blind staring at it. When the source of warmth and light withdraws, then terrible winter. When burning and relentless, it draws too close, their narcotically gorgeous fecund earth withers as if the sun, as if the sun taught us what we will ever know of the source. Now, too far, then too close. Blood Island, where you for a time lived. And the last poem I'm gonna read is a Sestina. Uh, Sestina is a poem that made up of um, uh, lines of uh, six stanzas and the stanzas end was all end with the same six words in an in an order that is fixed from the beginning that is uh, fixed by the rules of the sestina a little too complicated to explain what those rules are now but the point is you have no freedom about when those six words are going to recur in each, each stanza. Now, I've only written one Sestina, um, and I will never write another because I almost died writing this one. And I felt I was incredibly lucky to have escaped uh, with my, well, with my not totally humiliated. Um, the title is the six words that are repeated at the end of each stanza. Um, if see no end in is. What none knows is when, not if. Now that your life nears its end, when you turn back what you see is ruin. You think it is a prison. No, it is a vast resonating chamber in which each thing you say or do is new, but the same. What none knows is how to change. Each plateau you reach, if single limited only itself, includes traces of all the others. So that in, in the end, limitation frees you. There is no end. If you once see what is there to see. You cannot see what is there to see. Not when she whose love you failed is standing next to you. Then, as if refusing the knowledge that life unseparated from her is death, as if again scorning your refusals, she turns away. The end achieved by the unappeased is burial within. Familiar spirit within whose care I grew, within whose disappointment I twist, may we at last see by what necessity the double bind is in the end the figure for human life, by what we love is precluded always by something else we love, as if each no we speak is yes, each yes, no. The prospect is mixed 
but elsewhere the forecast is no better. The eerie where you perch in exhaustion has food and is out of the wind if cold. You feel old, young, old, young. You scan the sea for movement of the promise of sex or food is the prospect that bewildered you to this end. Something in you believes that it is not the end. When you wake, sixth grade will start. The finite you know, you fear is infinite. Even at 11, what you love is what you should not love, which endless bullies intuit unerringly. The future will be different. You cannot see the end. What none knows is when, not if. Thanks. And I hope everybody looks at the John Yao book. It's a marvelous, very wonderful book of Joe's work. Thank you. No, thank you, Frank. Our next speaker is Richard Tillinghast. Richard Tillinghast's new collection, Blue, If Only I Could Tell You, is the winner of the White Pine Press Poetry Prize. Blue, If Only I Could Tell You is his 13th collection. In addition to books, in, in addition to five books of creative nonfiction, his poems have appeared in the American Poetry Review, The Atlantic, The New Yorker, Paris Review, The New Republic, The New Criterion, The Best American Poetry, and elsewhere. The recipient of grants from the Guggenheim Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts, the British Council, the Irish Arts Council, and the Bread Loaf Writers Conference. He lives in Hawaii and spends his summers in Sewanee, Tennessee. Please welcome to the screen, Richard Tillinghast. Let me find you. There you are. You're good to go, Richard. It's uh, such an honor to read with Frank. He's somebody whose poetry I've been reading and learning from for I don't know how many years. And uh, Lindsay and Alice, thank you. And especially uh, Roger uh, for creating this Write America series. Um, I've got a plan uh, to read five poems and I will start with one called Exodus. I would say that some of us spend our entire lives in one place and, and we seldom venture out and either find satisfaction in that or are frustrated by it. For others, it's quite the opposite. Um, for some who migrate or go into exile it's a choice for others it's an escape and sometimes it's a desperate escape exodus the refugees were nervous glancing up toward the hills sensing the sniper with his telescopic sight and sinister nickname what did they care about the history of human displacement they were changing money and trying to sell their watches. Trucks packed with soldiers, boys really, sped along the dock, firing their rifles into the air. I think the gypsies were the most afraid. Then a truck with a loudspeaker appeared, moving slow down the boulevard in the shade of palms and plane trees giving orders in three languages. How many souls, how many dreams of escape, how many nightmare nights could the little ship hold? They took on board as many as could pay. Small groups gathered on deck, talking quietly. It was an end and a beginning. Somebody had 
brought a bottle and they needed it. What a sigh ascended when the ship steamed out onto the uncaring ocean. My next poem is called The Blind Singer of Swananoa. It seems as if all through history, there's been a tradition of that the blind singer, the blind poet is someone who can see more than the rest of us, can sing better than the rest of us. The, the Greeks had Homer. We have Ray Charles. We have uh, Stevie Wonder. And here is my contribution to that uh, tradition. The blind singer of Swananoa. Swananoa is a place in Western North Carolina, but it is also just a word, a beautiful uh, Native American word. The blind singer of Swananoa. Blind, but her fingers on the fretboard find paths through the dark. I follow her voice along creek banks into the hills above Swananoa, where the lost nation wintered in bluffside caves, lit campfires they hoped the white men wouldn't catch wind of, and carved their thoughts into limestone. Wild canaries take up her song whippoorwills serving out the term of their bondage night by night and the mockingbirds mocking them. Folks around here believe troubled souls visit burying grounds despite prayers laid down by preachers over open graves and they call to each other in the voices of owls. Who knows what presences rise from these hills to hear her song? The fire builders and basket weavers who were hunted down and shot, runaways an hour ahead of the bloodhounds and slave patrols, deserters who stripped the insignia from their sleeves and limped wounded into the backwoods to die. The stragglers and bushwhackers who knew what it is to kill a man, the pretty girl who went for a walk with her lover and was never seen again. Play their song for me. I want to live in that darkness. Some of you may remember a song called Skylark. Skylark, have you anything to say to me? And there was also a car called a Skylark. Buick made it back in the early 1950s. It's always been one of my favorite cars. This is a poem about three friends who had the dream of finding an old Buick Skylark in a junkyard uh, restoring it and uh, driving it down the highway. Skylark. We treasure hunted her through every junkyard on the dusty fringes of Oakland and San Francisco, dreaming we would find her. Hood staved in, perhaps mice nesting in her upholstery, eucalyptus leaves ribboned along the sleek lines of her fenders. We were men who loved beauty, Carlos and Billy and I. And because we were American men, we looked for beauty in an automobile. A Buick Skylark, 1953, light-winged dryad of the open road, as Carlos called her, riffing on Whitman and Keats. Like the song that was also Skylark. Johnny Mercer and Hoagie Carmichael wrote it 
Ella Fitzgerald sang it. While our wives and children slept, we were going to work nights in Billy's garage, grinding the rust out, smoothing and priming and painting her to gleam like the sea off Laguna Beach. Her half-life began before Trump, before QAnon, before Nixon, before McCarthy and Roy Cohn. It was way back in the days of J. Edgar fucking Hoover. How brief her moment was, born from the uplift of power that sank the aircraft carriers of the rising sun, bombed the libraries and concert halls of men who burned the Jews of Europe in ovens and stacked their skulls in the world's imagination. Our dream was as American as baseball, as war, brief as a song on top 40. The blue sky radiated from our Skylark's chrome. Her V8 engine sang with full-throated ease as we glided through the years of our manhood behind the wheel of a song. So what if we never found her? We three amigos steering her down the great highway in our dreams. That's as real as anything. My daughter, Julia Claire Tillinghast, and I have translated some of the poems of the mid 20th century Turkish poet, poet Edip Jansever. We published them in a little book that Talisman House uh, brought out called Dirty August. I believe it's about 3.30 a.m. in Istanbul. And if any of my friends in Istanbul are crazy enough to be up at this hour, this one, this poem is for you. It's called Table. A man filled with the gladness of living put his keys on the table, put flowers in a copper bowl there. He put his eggs and milk on the table. He put there the light that came in through the window, sound of a bicycle, sound of a spinning wheel. The softness of bread and weather he put there. On the table, the man put things that happened in his mind, what he wanted to do in life. He put that there, those he loved, those he didn't love. The man put them on the table too. Three times three make nine. The man put nine on the table. He was next to the window, next to the sky. He reached out and placed on the table endlessness. So many days he had wanted to drink a beer. He put on the table the pouring of that beer. He placed there his sleep and his wakefulness, his hunger and his fullness he put there. Now that's what I call a table. It didn't complain at all about the load. It wobbled once or twice, then stood firm. The man kept piling things on. I'll read two more poems. I, I've lived in Hawaii now. I used to live in Ireland. I moved back to the U.S. Oh, I don't know, 12 years ago, something like that. And I've been living out on this island um, ever since then and i really don't write a lot of poems about um uh, it, hawaii hasn't quite filtered into my imagination yet but it's it's uh it's starting to do that and 
So I'll read a poem about where I live right now. It's called Refuge. A little house above the tsunami line, plumbed, wired, and swept, tatami mats on the floor. Trade winds riffling the palm fronds, a place to heal, and the knowledge there is work to be done. Doves' throaty calls, saffron flashes of finches, and the rice birds that hang upside down on stalks and peck at seeds. Starbucks or a train compartment or a room at the airport hotel outside Mexico City, it's all very well. But this is better. You've brewed me a tonic. You've painted the door red and the walls green. The orchids are in bloom. You gave me a compass, and here it is on my table, pointing north. Here's my last poem up for the occasion. This is something like a love song, love poem to a color. It's the title poem of this new book of mine. Blue, if only I could tell you. Many of you will know the poem by Federico Garcia Lorca. It goes, Verde, te quiero, verde, green, how, how I love you, green. Um, my favorite color is blue, I suppose. And this is all about the color blue. Blue. If only I could tell you how much I love you, Blue. When I buy ink, it's you I go looking for. Even before the sky turns blue and I roll out of bed and pull on my Levi's, I sail my gaze out over turquoise and ultramarine, salt breeze and leagues of ocean. Not officer he beat me up, Blue. Not his fingernails are turning blue. I fill my pen with Königsblau, listening to Miles, and vanishing into the inkwell's unfathomable O. I sniff the breeze for direction, minding the tilt of swells and the tide's mood swings. Shakespeare, in that movie they made about him, his fingers, whenever the camera let you see his hands, were blue with ink, even when he shimmied up the rich girl's father's palace walls. Do you remember your first set of oils? Cobalt, like Hokusai's great wave of Kanagawa, or the underside of a Winslow Homer swell in a storm off Barbados, the sharks beside themselves with anticipation, rolling like dogs. Aquamarine like a summer morning in Laguna, and the tube of Navy like World War II, victory at sea taking off from steel gray carriers, and men in blue pinstripes who made their fortunes off munitions. Is it hard sometimes to know just who you are? Green shimmers to the east of you, purple to the west. From the lapis of your earrings comes the resonance of temple bells. In the sapphires on your bracelets, I hear the blue whales singing as they launch up from the depths. Thank you. Frank, you just unmute and you guys can discuss anything yes. you like. There you go. Richard, that was great. Beautiful. Thank you, Frank. Ooh, I'm feeling blue. <laughs> <laughs> You're always an impossible act to follow. And uh, so I'm sort of trembling in my boots uh, after hearing you read, but uh, I no, the danger my the, the danger is gonna is with me as melodrama. Um, <laughs> anyway. I, it was wonderful to hear you. You read beautifully. Thank you so much. Um, 
the uh, uh, Alice asked us uh, at the beginning if we had a a young poet, a younger poet that we wanted to um, recommend, and uh, 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 there's a, a, a young poet named Jesse Nathan who's about to publish his first book. He lives in Berkeley, and uh, he's a very good poet. And uh, I strongly recommend uh, his work and him. He's very smart and a very good poet. I would like to recommend to you the uh, poetry of uh, Nicole Brown. She's an Appalachian poet, though, uh, you, you know, you always reduce the... Uh, you always reduce the essence of any poet by saying where they're from. I don't think anybody would ever say Frank Bedard is a well-known Bakersfield poet, for well, example. In a way, I am. I absolutely. <laughs> anyway. Anyway, I, I love Nicole's work, and um, I live part of, I'm from the South, I'm from Tennessee, and I live part of Part of, uh, I spend my summers in uh, Suwannee, which is halfway between Middle and East Tennessee. Um, and so I grew up in Memphis, which is definitely not in the Appalachians, but I, because I've spent so much time over there uh, in Middle and East Tennessee, I, I, I have a feeling for that part of the world. And I've come to know Nicole's work. She wrote, she wrote an entire book about donkeys, which I thought, how can anybody do this? It's it's a, it it just it just opens and opens and opens. So I would, um, uh, I would recommend Nicole Brown's uh, poems to you. Fantastic. The name seems familiar. Uh... Uh, but I will remember that. Fantastic. I I, I should also say um, uh, it's perhaps in some sense graceless to uh, 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 to praise somebody who just won the Nobel Prize uh, a couple of years ago, but Louise Glick has just published a book uh, which is. Um, uh, uh, oh, what is wrong with me? Uh, I'm suddenly blanking on its title. Um, um, anyway, yeah, it's I know the book too. Yeah, it has a it has a kind of uh, hermetic title that seems to refer to what's it called? The um... it's a prose book, uh, and and it's it's a surprising and. Uh, here it is, uh, okay. Marigold and Rose. And uh, she imagines herself, uh, she creates a language for uh, these two children who are pre-verbal. And it's, it's quite a marvelous book. And you would never have predicted it from her earlier work. Uh, anyway, it's a wonderful book called Marigold and Rose. So uh, here it is, voila. I really liked the, her, her most recent book of poetry, Frank. Um, can, that's the one, what's it called? You know, the, um, in, anyway, I can't remember the name of it, but, but ben, it's, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, several people who, who have uh, reviewed the book have uh, talked about how the poems are of the nature of fables it's fascinating they're they're like little fairy tales and i that's a you know fair, the fairy tale form it's just something that's part of who we are and um i love the way she handles that the, in the sense of mystery in her poems yes yes the fact that she can she can reinvent things like a fable mm -hmm. is, is astonishing, and and she does she does it with a kind of necessity and freshness that is 
completely um, remarkable. Yeah. So those are some books that we like uh, by young poets and and old and poets. Not so young poets. Yeah. Right. Well, I thought I'd ask a couple questions. I haven't seen any come through the chat. So if anybody has a question that they want me to ask, be sure to just type it in. Um, one of the questions that I discussed earlier, and I think Richard had may have had an answer on this one. Have you been on any literary pilgrimage or were in the course of research or um, you know, intel for, for your writing that you would want to share with us? You know, places that you've been that that we might not have traveled or or stories about encounters with people in strange places or any have you ever had that experience? And you're in <laughs> Hawaii, and I love hearing the birds, by the way. Oh, good. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you, I think what you're you're hearing either the saffron finch or the little uh, Japanese white eye. I believe they're both uh, birds that were brought here as in cages, you know, for for to be, you know, to sit in a cage in somebody's room and sing. But of course they got out and then they, now they're everywhere, uh, which is wonderful. Uh, a literary pilgrimage. Um, well, some years ago, I, I was fortunate enough to get this grant that uh, Harvard administers, I think Harvard administers. Anyway, it's called the Amy Lowell Travel Tra this has an awkward, funny kind of name, the the Amy Lowell Traveling Poetry Fellowship or something like that. And um, I went to the west of Ireland on that pilgrimage, on that uh, grant, which turned out to be a pilgrimage because the little village where my friend Tom Lynch uh, and his father uh, and I went over and drove around and, uh, to a lot of little villages and just a lot of places in the west of Ireland uh, trying to pick out a place for, for me and my family to live. It turned out to be 12 miles uh, from Yates's Tower. So it was, there was just something about living there where Yates had lived and written. Uh, we were talking about who's your favorite poet and I really can't think of anybody who's any poet who's been more of an example uh, to me than Yeats. And I met a man in the town who who uh, who remembered yeah. Yeats and had told tell stories about the kinds of things that Yeats would get up to. And uh, for example, there was a he had, there was a workman. He hired a workman to uh, put a um, a uh, sort of a handle on one of his doors, and the workman was very annoyed because Yates would never speak to him. So he put the handle, he put the door handle on upside down, just to annoy Yates. And then the man said, "Then Yates had plenty to to say to him, but this man ran a hardware store." And when um, when Cool Park, Lady Gregory's house, had been uh, sold and the uh, the uh, the furniture and everything auctioned off, he bought Lady Gregory's mahogany desk and it was sitting there in the hardware store. And he bought uh, I, I don't know who the sword. It wasn't the sword that Yates talks about the Japanese sword that Yates talks about in his beautiful poem. But it was a sword that was hanging on the wall at uh, Cool Park, and there it was in the hardware store. So I, I, what I really like is the intersection between the literary life and the and the actual life. I think there's something just really fascinating about that. I I, I never tire of uh, of seeing that intersection between the imaginative life and the uh, and the actual life. That was something I was able to experience in relation to Yates. Are you, either one of you, what is your day-to-day -day writing 
rhythm in other words are you get up very disciplined right for two hours take law i mean that kind of thing or are you just binger or describe how how you write in terms of a rhythm or do you know do you know what i'm really trying to say are you sure. a pantser sure. or a <laughs> i'd like to hear frank talk about that okay frank well no i'm i i do not feel i don't feel i have any wisdom uh uh, about it. I'm, I've always been, I can only write when I have something that impels me. I have something to say, something that I'm feeling. I'm struggling to find some verbal embodiment of a, of a, of a, a, a sense or an emotion. Um, and as a result, when I'm not writing, I'm really not writing. And, um, um, and I get very depressed because in a way I'm only happy if I'm writing and I'm, I'm in a state of high anxiety when I'm writing, but on the other hand, I, so I, I move between high anxiety and depression, uh, when I'm, when I'm not writing. So I, that, I feel that, that that's, there's no wisdom in what I'm saying. Uh, I have no recommendations out, uh, based on it. Um, uh, well, is there anything you do to kind of break a, a, a dry spell? Any, any kind of, you watch a movie, you go for a walk, I mean, visit, call a friend. I mean, is there any kind of thing that usually works for you to kind of break through that? Or do you just kind of organically let it, let it happen? Frank. Well, I, I think Yates is in fact a wonderful, uh, uh, guide here. Um, uh, Yates very much, I, I can't quote it at the moment, but essentially uh, uh, he emphasizes the locating those things the one feels passionately about but in a divided way and mm -hmm. um and it's out of those divisions that that the poem or the work of art comes um i mean he and 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 his work perfectly embodies that um uh I think you've answered i think you've answered the question thank you really um richard how is it what's the rhythm of your writing i mean is it a discipline of every single day or you wait for something to inspire you or how is it you approach your writing i've written uh, several nonfiction books as well as books of poetry and when I'm writing nonfiction, I, uh, I'm very disciplined. I, I get up and have breakfast and, and I write 500 words a day. That's just what I do. And, and uh, when I get to 500 words, I stop writing. And, and you can really cover, 500 words doesn't sound like very much, but if you do it every day, you can uh, really get a lot of work done. Um, as for poetry, uh, it's funny. I, I I feel much. I'm. I mean, w when Frank was talking about the feeling of divided emotions, I, I know you know one of your poems, "Od uh, at Amo," right? The really short one. I I I I I hate and I love. I mean, that would to me. As soon as you said that, I thought about that little poem of yours. Um, I um. But I feel the same way. I, I I really I really hate it when I'm not writing. I I feel I feel horrible when I'm not writing. I just it, it's I feel anxious. I feel out of sorts, and um, so I so I I want to be writing. And, and um, uh, I guess a lot of writers are obsessive and i i'm cer i'm certainly that way in certainly in relation to my uh 
to my work habits because I, um, I have kind of a whole system of notebooks. I have a, I have a little notebooks that I carry around. And I don't know, I won't bore you with the details, but I, I get these little books and I glue photographs that I've made on, on them. I care because I like to, I like to be, have beautiful things. And, um, and then I have these larger notebook anyway that's kind of boring i'm sure to to everybody but um but i i as i revise i go from one notebook to to the other and and i keep working on it until i get it to the stage where i can type it up um i've gotten into a, an odd habit out here in hawaii uh in that I uh, I mean it's not an odd habit to take a nap. I take a nap every day, but when I get up, that's when I write. I I've never written in the afternoon before, but but now I uh, that's what I do. I I write every afternoon, and then uh, once I get through doing that, I fix supper because I cook supper every night. And uh, um, yeah, but that's my process working one version then revising it from one notebook to another notebook and just kind of keeping it going uh like that i i need those i need to be inspired by i i i really like to have beautiful things around me and um and i create these notebooks that are beautiful things they're kind of halfway between workbooks and scrapbooks because i I uh, I paste pictures of my family and pictures that I of stuff that I I like the look of, and so every time I open up the notebook, there's there's this beautiful thing. Um, anyway, uh, Alice, that's kind of my approach well, to it. It's so interesting because every author, every poet what has a whole different process that is uniquely their own and always they always start out with well just like so many other people I do this and I'm never finding that it's similar to anybody else it's all unique to themselves so thank you for sharing that both of you hey you um, know so one other thing I would add to that though is when I first started writing poetry there was there was no such thing as what what is called a prompts a prompt you just wrote poems and and uh then it, it, during the course of oh. years teaching poetry writing i started hearing people talk about okay well, what do we give us some prompts you know i'm thinking what and um but now i'm enthusiastic about prompts there's some really good prompts i i was in a group with laura kaziski uh, a couple of years ago and a couple of pretty good poems came from these prompts and and sometimes i actually give myself a make up these prompts for myself for example rosanna warren's one of my favorite poets and i i read one of her poems and and i thought gosh i wonder if i could write something like that um so i kind of made this thing up uh uh summon up a um summon up a, 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 a an event an extreme weather event and then you know get into that and then uh and then it then you ask it, at a certain point in the poem you ask yourself a question about who you are and then also in the poem there's a quote from well, you could call it wisdom literature. I think, I can't remember. Uh, hers was from Nietzsche, I think. Mine was from Lao Tzu. And so that be, became this prompt that I gave myself. And uh, so, yeah. I, I, That's really me. interesting. We have, one of the things that we like with, we have a prompt writing workshop once a month here is that it can address all levels at the same time. So they're not personally yeah. doing it they have an opportunity, but the fact that you would make up your own prompts is really fascinating. Well, I mean, you know, the, when you make, when you use a prompt or when you imitate a, a poem by, by another poet, 
uh, you would think, oh, well, gosh, I'm just copying this. But it's it, like James Merrill said, you look out the window and describe what you see out the window and it's it's going to be totally different because of the idiosyncrasies of your particular mind and your particular mm -hmm. take on the world. So, um, so I think, uh, I think the idea of um, imitation for me, at least it, it's a very respectable idea. You, 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 you think you're imitating, you start off by imitating a poem by some other poet, it turns out to be totally different. I'm just thinking about um, uh, Robert, oh, then this happens in the case of revision as well. I'm thinking about a poem that uh, Robert Lowell uh, wrote in his early days. Uh, as I Frank will correct me if I've got this wrong, but it started off as, it was dedicated to Peter Taylor and it started off, uh, being called to our lady on the feast of, of the what was it the feast of epiphany or ascension or one of those <laughs> and after lowell had had worked on it for a couple of months it came out being called to a whore at the brooklyn navy yard <laughs> <laughs> beautiful yeah very good yeah, yeah. Oh, good heavens. Uh, gentlemen, we have really filled up an hour, gone a mm -hmm. little over because I couldn't stop. I just didn't turn it off. So I just want to have the one question that I ask every single guest on Write America. What are you reading now? Why don't you start, Frank? Well, I, I'm thinking I just, I just, uh, uh, reread uh, Louise's book uh, *Marigold* and 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 Rose and um, and I'm and I'm reading the John Yao. I mean, I in fact I have not finished it, uh, but he's very smart and it's very well done. Um, and it's generous in its in its understanding of of what's happened in in the visual arts. Um, so I strongly recommend this book. And, Thank you for bringing that book to us. Yeah. It's two weeks in a row that book has been brought to the table on Right America. Miranda Beeson recommended it last week. So yeah. I think all of us should pay attention. What are you reading, Richard? Well, I have this habit of, of having a, a great big stack of books on my bedside table and reading. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> about, I don't know, 15 or so books, kind of a little of one and then move on to, yeah. to the other. So, um, uh, okay, so this, this would kind of be a sample of what I'm reading now. Uh, I'm reading a Billy Collins new book called Musical Tables. I'm reading a book by uh, an old friend and former student of mine, Elise Passion, it's called The Nightlife. Uh, mm. I'm reading those for poetry. And then I uh, I never, everybody else in America read uh, Tim O'Brien's book, The Things They Carried, but I never did. And now I'm reading that and realizing what a good book it is. And I also read a lot of history. I am... Um, one of the books that I just finished is called Blue Tattoo. It's a story of the life of Olive Oatman. She's someone who's, she was, came from a Mormon family. They were immigrating across country in the mid 19th century. Her family was massacred uh, by an Indian tribe in the Southwest. And then she was adopted into the Mojave Indians and the it's called the blue tattoo because they they made this blue tattoo on her chin that's kind of one of the things that you did when you were a member of that tribe so that's a book uh that I just finished and liked a lot I like to read a lot of American uh, uh particularly from the stories about the the uh you know the the indian wars the settlement of the american west all those conflicts and finally uh my uh 
dear friend and ex-wife, uh, Mary Tillinghast, gave me this the new book by Bob Dylan. It's called The Philosophy of Modern Song. The excerpts that I read from it in the New York in the New York Times led me to think this was going to be one of the worst books ever written. <laughs> But it's not. It's really, I mean, Dylan knows <laughs> so much. You know, he right. his knowledge of of uh, of the modern popular song is really encyclopedic. And sometimes he just spins off into stuff. You're thinking this guy is crazy. Uh, and then sometimes he really hits it. I mean, how could you? I'll just give one example. You know the the Vincent Human song uh, "Without a Song." It's a wonderful, wonderful mm -hmm. song. Sure. Uh, you know whose version Bob Dylan says is good? Okay, I'll give you a hint: Cardigan Sweater, Perry Como. Oh my God! Perry Como, come on! It's kind of like you're thinking Bob Dylan. You know all songs have you never listened to ray charles's version of that song anyway that's an that's a book that i'm reading right now huh someone so since we're recommending a lot of yes, books please do this is a book that i'm really astonished by it's called hollywood an oral history and it's simply a transcription of the interviews that have been done for for tens for, for decades of, of, of uh, people who've made movies mm -hmm. and they tell mm -hmm. great stories and it's marvelous. And, uh, and it really has insight on, on people one cares about because they're, they're, you know, they're people that observe, observed uh, the creators of movies very closely. And um, anyway, it's called Hollywood and Oral History by Janine Bassinger and Sam Wasson, Wasson, W-A-S-S-O-N. Anyway, uh, an oral history, it's from Harper. And I strongly recommend it. Gentlemen, our time's up and it has been a wonderful evening and I really thank you both. I'm gonna have to mute you and minimize you to sign off this evening, but I cannot thank you enough. So I'd like to thank Frank and Richard for participating in Write America this evening and to everyone who tuned in tonight. And thank you to Roger Rosenblatt for creating this original and important series to look forward to each week. Tonight's episode is the perfect example of the purpose and mission of Write, of Write America. We hope to see you all on Monday, December 5th next week, as we welcome Alice McDermott and Jill McCorkle. Please remember to check out Bird's Books Write America page where you can find out information about our upcoming episodes and maybe purchase a book or two. Thank you so much, folks. Have a great evening.